You're listening to AZ Sports with Matt and Rich. Welcome back to episode four of AZ Sports with Matt and Rich. I'm your host, Rich, my co-host, Matt. His uh, webcam is probably going to be off for today. He's having uh, technical difficulties with his internet, but uh, we want to make sure the audio is nice and clear for this episode. What, uh, you don't what need to lie been... to the people. I'm just ugly. It's... Oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> you don't All got to right. lie to I'm just ugly. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I saw on Twitter you're, you went uh, back to uh, Sonic the Hedgehog for, for round three. How did that go? Uh, yeah, uh, I didn't, wasn't even supposed to go, but, uh, my wife ended up buying tickets because there was a mascot dressed as Sonic. I, we showed up, but there was also, they're giving out another poster or whatever. And then I didn't want to do it because there was nothing but like, I said 12 year olds in the little video I posted. It was actually like eight, seven year olds. And I, I hate small children, but my wife's like, she saw how horrifying the mascot was. was like, Hey, get in this line. I want you to take the picture of them more for me. So I was like, fine, took the picture and uh, enjoyed the movie for a third time. So that's what me, an intellectual, does when I'm trying to avoid making YouTube videos. And I go watch Sonic. There you go. Uh, for myself, I ended up finishing Dying Light 2 this week. That was uh, extremely disappointing. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> the ending I got <laughs> was not very good. Not very happy with it. All right, let's. Uh, did you make all the move. wrong choices, or did you just not like do everything in the right order? Like, you, was there a bunch of side content? Like for me, Mass Effect Two, I rushed to the end and like half my crew died. So like, is, is that how it is in this game, or? Sorta, yes. People did die. I'm not gonna spoil anything. And like, yeah, it was just all the effort and time that I put into the game and it's like one or two choices just made it like the worst ending possible. Pretty much almost it, it could have been worse, but it was, it was pretty bad. I went and I was like, all right, did I do like a good job or was this like a terrible ending? And I looked it up afterwards. I'm like, this was a terrible ending. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, well maybe I'll go back and play it. I did get the uh, bigger version to play all the DLCs and stuff. Cause I do like Dying Light, and for as many faults as Dying Light 2 had, I still had a good time on it, for sure. It was good, as long as you're having fun, even though your ending was trash. But then again, like I said, I can relate there. I can understand when you, like, make bad decisions or you, like, rush through certain parts, and, yeah, it comes back to bite you later. Yep. Yeah, it definitely did. All right, so let's hop into our first topic, which is... Uh, one of the two sports teams that are actually successful here in the Valley right now, and that is the Rattlers. Uh, I know that you had some uh, really good coverage and depth um, note-taking on their most recent game. Uh, I was lucky enough to see about half of the third period and then all of the fourth period. Um, I'll be honest, it completely slipped my mind. I keep, I forget about games, I'll be honest. Even, even Coyotes games, I just like, forget they're on and I'm like, oh crap and and you know, toss it on. Um but uh you were able to watch that game and it was another absolute uh crap kicking, shall we say? Uh I yeah, think the it was score crap was... kicking, pounding. Sixty six to thirty three. I, I I will go ahead and fully take over control here because the Rattlers, that's my wheelhouse. So yesterday was actually or Friday, excuse me. Friday was the first day I actually got to use my own season ticket. So I got to sit in the seats that I'm supposed to be sitting in when I don't get better seats from a friend of mine. But I was so bored by the uh, by the end of the first half because it wasn't even a game. Just to try to give you guys context, that's how dominant the Rattlers were. And as an Arizona fan, it was so fun to get to trash talk and say they destroyed a poverty franchise. And, and San Diego, they originally expanded in, I think, in 2019, then they had a hiatus in uh, 2021. So they've never had a winning season so far, and I think they've only had one win on the year, and it was just it was great to, to get to watch the chat and the, the one San Diego fan that was pretending they had a chance. And I just, I'm the reason he watched, by the way. I, I just texted Rich, and I was like, hey, coward, watch the game right now. Yep. Uh, anyway, first play of the game the Rattlers get the ball Drew Powell finds Troy Pelletier for a 26 yard touchdown less than a minute in like I said first play seven nothing that was the only score of the entire first quarter 
Then the second quarter starts to really get interesting. So l less than 10 seconds in, on the first play of the second quarter, uh, Brooks with a 19-yard rushing touchdown. The point after is no good. It's 13-0 at that point. Then Ernesto Lacayo, the kicker. They go for a kick. It's fumbled. He recovers it. Rattlers get the ball back. And then I think the, the next play or a couple plays later, it still ends up being 40 or 50 seconds later, Drew Powell finds Todd Athey for a 15-yard touchdown. Get a two-point conversion, 21-0 Arizona. Then about a minute and a half after that, Kyrie Woods, the two-time defensive player of the week so far this season, picks off the pass. The Rattlers get another touchdown about five minutes later. Drew Powell, a 10-plus yard rush. That point after is no good because Ernesto Lacayo can't kick a ball to save his life this year. 27-0 Rattlers. Then there's a really bad onside kick because for whatever reason, they like to do that every now and again. San Diego gets the ball about 20 or 30 seconds later. Former Arizona Hot Shots legend Rashad Ross gets a touchdown, 27-7 Arizona. Then Arizona gets the ball back. They score again with less than three minutes to go. It's 33-7 at that point, but the point after... This was one of the weirdest plays I've ever seen in my life. I just wrote down in my notes, point after attempt, whatever happened, uh, because it, it was a bobbled like snap, and they couldn't set the, the they couldn't set the kick. I don't know why I'm talking over myself right now. Uh, they couldn't set the kick, and the guy who goes to place it just runs with the ball. But I don't know if it's in the rules you can't run forward like that, like you can't fake out like that. So he just runs around to the side a little bit and then throws it out of bounds. It was just. The dumbest play, Rattlers end up getting the ball back again because their defense plays really well. There's about, I think, 12 seconds to go. Uh, they thought they got the ball out of bounds to try to go for one final play. They did not. 33-7 to at the half. It's a very interesting number right there. 33 for the Rattlers. That would be the total that San Diego would score in the game. The Rattlers had that in the first half. Oh, and also in the second because they had 66 in the game. I don't want to bore you with the second half, uh, but... Demry Croft enters in right before the start of the fourth quarter. The former Tucson Sugar Skulls, all rookie quarterback, and ends up uh, being responsible for. Let me just count this. I think it's uh, three touchdowns down here, two or three touchdowns. Uh, Dale Winfrey gets an interception. I think it's one of the first plays of the third quarter. I had an entire little list down here of just the weird scored on first plays or, or first play like significance here. So they scored in the first offensive play of the game. Rattler scored in the first play of the second quarter. They scored on the first play after that fumble recovery, and then uh, Woods had the interception on the first play after the two-point conversion. It's a lot of weird things lining up there. Anyway, final score, 66-33. to 33. I won't continue to go on and bore you because it really just turned into the defense didn't care anymore in the second half because the Rattlers' offense was unstoppable. I think they scored on all but one possession, and that was that possession to end the first half when they thought they got it out of bounds to stop the clock but they did not. The referee said they didn't get it out of bounds. So domination, the yeah. pure, simple domination. However, it's against a much lesser opponent. So if we're, if we're talking about how the Rattlers stack up against the big dogs, yes, they are undefeated. They're five and zero. they're playing very well right now. Uh, they play the Frisco, the Frisco fighters. You said on the 30th, it's in Frisco. Yes. So I want to, um, bring that up on the podcast as well. Uh, if you are interested in watching, April 30th uh, is going to be when the Rattlers take on Frisco Fighters in Frisco, and that'll be at 7.05 uh, p.m. Arizona time. I don't know if that's Mountain or Pacific because here in Arizona, we ignore daylight savings time. But uh, if you are interested in watching that, feel free to watch that on YouTube. And they have all those games readily available for you to watch. And you can maybe even see us in the uh, the YouTube chat mocking people. So <laughs> just having some fun. Yeah. It's always me. Like I said, as a Coyotes fan, as an Arizona sports fan, I love being able to call someone a poverty franchise for the first time in my life. So I just wanted to have my fun. And it was at the expense of a California team. My heart is so warmed with just that little fact. But yeah, no, it's on the Indoor Football League teams uh, or Indoor Football League's YouTube channel. This is not sponsored. I just want this game to grow. This is completely selfish on my part. I completely acknowledge that. Do not care. This sport is amazing. I, I think it's the best way to watch football. And yes, I am one of the mindless drones that will watch NFL football on Sundays. I'm right there with you, okay? I'm a brainwashed fool that will still root for the Cardinals. But this is the way to go if you really want to watch some high-quality football. But anyway. So they got a couple of better opponents coming up 
I think Frisco overall should be a better team than the San Diego to face off with. They have a rematch of the United Bowl coming up in a few weeks on uh, May 14th. They're also going to uh, Tucson on the 7th, and I just might make my wife drive down south uh, for that matchup because I kind of want to see the Rattlers in different places. I miss the one in Vegas, but going up north and down south, those are doable. Those are like two and a half hour drives. I can do that. Do you know where the uh, Sugar Skulls play? Do they play in the the uh, TCC or do they play? Yeah, they they play exactly where the where the the Roadrunners play, and they call it oh, the okay. Boneyard because their team is dead, because their team sucks, because Tucson sucks. Look, I like the Roadrunners. I would much prefer them playing in the old uh, Madhouse on McDowell, but they just prefer to have a brand new market for them. Or put them up north in the Tim's Toyota Center. Just saying. I, Get them away from Tucson. I don't. I don't like going down to Tucson, but I'll do it. <laughs> I don't think they'll. Uh, I don't think they'll move out of Tucson. Tucson is a very growing market, and if people don't know, so here in Arizona, <clears throat> the Phoenix metropolitan area is very large. I think what we have six million people now, six million, um, which is massive, and then uh, down in Tucson, even though it looks like a I'll be real with you, kind of a crappy town. Uh, if you go there, it clearly was built for like maybe 100,000 people. All the roadways are like, you know, late, one lane going each way. And you're talking about like main arteries of the city, you know. And uh, they have now, I think, close to 800,000 or 900,000 people. That's like insane to think about. You talk about, just to quickly switch over to hockey here and how... You know, the NHL is like, oh, move, move the t the teams to Quebec, move them to Quebec. Like, <laughs> Tucson alone has more people than Quebec. Like, get that, wrecked, hard. Quebec! Yeah, but I, th that's why I doubt that you'll see any team really move out of Tucson unless it's just not viable mon money wise, because it is a, uh, a very much a growing market down there. Yeah, it's like, look, listen. If you ask anyone in the greater Phoenix area, which I can tell you right now in like three years with how the West Valley is developing, Buckeye might be considered greater Phoenix in that in that time frame. But it's literally wherever the metropolitan area extends to and it goes all the way from, from I'm going to cap it off at Litchfield Park, maybe like Peoria or whatever, all the way down to like Chandler is what we would probably consider the the greater Phoenix area. If you ask anyone in there, they're going to tell you Tucson is trash. It's like a mini L.A. Yeah. with almost none of the infrastructure. And that's funny because L.A. has almost no infrastructure anyway. And yet it's still growing. It's still bigger than Quebec. I would actually I find it funny. The IFL sees Arizona as such a healthy market. We have three football teams here. Yet you guys want to talk about how we can't support a hockey team. No, if we had an NHL team in Tucson and Tucson was actually designed to accommodate a million people. I guarantee you right now they would not be bottom five in attendance. That's just how yep. dense the population is to give you an idea. And again, yep. I personally dislike Tucson. Probably comes from being an ASU fan just because Tucson's kind of a crap hole, like I said. I We love you guys down there just from a distance. Just nice, safe two we and a half get, hour we, distance. We can't get too close or else the smell will make us sick. <laughs> Anyway, it's a, I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, we're all just joking and having fun. All right. You're down, People of Tucson you're talk the exact way about us. It's fine. <laughs> your downtown area is beautiful. I'm glad that you guys are working that out. And I hope that 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 uh, redesign expands outwards because uh, if you guys have never been down there, they have some incredible murals down there. Uh, I think it was one guy who made like almost all the murals in their downtown area and they have some beautiful murals all over the uh all over the place which is something that you don't see here in arizona or here in phoenix and on top of that it's actually a, it, it's a pretty nice town to watch some hockey they've they've rallied around the roadrunners in the past if the roadrunners were a little more consistently successful they typically start off very well and then pitter out if they were more consistently successful you'd see them a little higher up in the attendance it is a good market down there so to throw you guys a bone Mainly because I wanted to talk about this anyway, because I do like the Roadrunners. And we're just giving you guys a little bit of trash. That's how we do it up here. Let's talk about Rasmus Coronan. Picked by the Arizona Coyotes last year, 122nd overall. And the real... 
the the main reason why he was of any importance. He's an 18 year old kid that was playing in the highest adult league in Finland. Uh, I think it's Liga, or you can correct me on that. But he was playing in the highest level of competition there. Only played a handful of games the, the season pre, the season prior, but it's still impressive that this kid managed to get there anyway. He's played two games in Tucson so far. His debut was on the 10th at Rockford. He surrendered four goals, saved 24 with an 857 save percentage. No one's going to say that was an amazing performance. All right, we're not going to make excuses for that. But his game against Colorado, all right, monster, absolute mad lad. And he gave up three goals. So that, just to kind of give you an idea of how I'm about to praise him, forget the three goals. It, in my opinion, if a goalie in the NHL should be giving up no fewer than two on average a game, for the AHL, it's probably like three and a half. So. Uh, 37 saves for this young man, for this young mad lad, this monster, this beast with a 925 save percentage. I'm really interested to see what they do in the future down there with him and uh, Prozvitov. Uh, I don't really think with how Prozvitov's played this year, it could just be a down year. I don't know if he's going to come back and play like a monster in, in training camp. I'm going to assume it's going to be Prozy number one, Corona number two going forward in Tucson for at least another year or so. And that's going to be interesting because this kid's got a lot of talent and uh, a 37 save performance in any professional league. Even if it was the ECHL, it'd still be impressive. The A is it's a lot of guys that are trying to break into the NHL. A lot of guys that were in the NHL for a regular amount of time, you know, guys that just kind of fell out. That's a good level of competition. So I, I just wanted to give him a little bit of praise there and just give you a little bit of a peek into what's going on in Tucson. Coronan, two games in, one bad game, one game that's pretty solid, especially considering how bad the defense has been, and also injury ridden, and also, you know, being an Arizona farm team. He's definitely shown that he's probably going to take Coach Nosh's, uh role <clears throat> down the AHL, and I think it's safe to say that Coach Nosh will probably not be re-signed this year, and they'll probably just let him walk. He'll probably go back to San Diego, or... Uh, uh, San, Jose, San Jose, maybe. Yeah. Um, Listen, if they if they re-sign him, we get to riot because Kozanash has been awful at any level he's played this year. Like it's yeah. he was supposed to be a replacement for Aiden Hill, and if you look at how Aiden Hill has disappointed, not played terribly, but has disappointed uh, in in San Jose, uh, we still lost the trade in that aspect but well, we won it because of the extra asset i'm talking about just yeah. the goalies just yeah, the idea of what they did with the two goalies because we no matter what we won with the extra asset but i'm talking about just the goalies we lost that let's accept mm -hmm. the loss let the man walk raspis cronin should be good give him his like two to three years in the eight probably three to four actually in the AHL to develop ivan give him another year next year see what happens maybe he earns a couple more games in the nhl maybe he doesn't I still don't think this year is going to be an example of what Ivan's going to be throughout his career, but you never know. Got to always keep an eye on all that, but yeah. Let Kozanosh walk. I don't know what they do with David Tendek. I don't really care. As long as Prozatov and Cronin are in Tucson next year, I think they, at least goaltending-wise, barring injuries, they'll be fine. Yep, I agree. Let's uh, move on to another successful team here in Arizona, and that will be the... Uh, Phoenix Suns. The Phoenix Suns play their first playoff game here today. Uh, we are actually trying to record this episode right before game one. So uh, we are anticipated and uh, angsty about going to watch that game before. Uh, I will say uh, Suns in four, question mark. <laughs> All right. Here's here's Wait. what my gut says. <laughs> Suns in four. Suns in four. We need to record a video of us just fighting in the stands. We can use GRA. No one's ever going to be there again. So we can just go use use the building whenever. Anyway, so. My gut says Suns in five. And here's why. The Pelicans, they are not a bad team. right? They are a, a good, solid basketball team. Uh, their big three hasn't really been together that long. They acquired McCollum, of course, uh, from Portland, I think, around the trade deadline. Maybe a little bit earlier than the trade deadline. But they are not a bad team. They're definitely, they got a little bit of size to them. They're going to walk into this with something to prove, which is fine. I still do not have any concerns with the Suns beating them. But they are not going to go down in four, in my opinion, because they are just, they're too scrappy. They are good enough to compete at in, in the playoffs, in my opinion, just not deep into them. So they're going to win game four at home to avoid the sweep, Suns in five. That's, that's okay. what I got. 
And uh, I'm just, I, it's finally here. I'm excited because it's, it's, we were talking about it before the show. It's kind of with the Rattlers right now, especially with, they're beating up on lesser opponents, but with the Suns all year, these teams are built to be co- like contenders. You don't, the regular season, it's fine. We got the, the record for the Suns. Rattlers 5-0, and it looks great, yes. But right now, the fans, we are looking forward to the playoffs, and they're finally here. This is when it's actually like exciting to, yeah. to get to really see like what they're going to do on the biggest stage, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm hyped. I'm actually feeling some excitement again, and I'm just like, let's get the I'm, game on. I'm trying I want to see book ball out. I'm trying to think. Everybody's healthy, right? We don't have any, we don't have any injuries, and uh, we, we rested a couple of guys so that they're ready to go in the playoffs, right? Like, I think this is like loaded perfectly to, uh, you know, not disappoint. Hopefully. Uh, like they they did it right. They let the guys play together as much as possible to maintain the momentum and the chemistry. And my my biggest thing was I didn't want to see them start falling off the end of the year. Then you rest them and they're going into the playoffs with a question mark. No, when yep. the starters are playing, they were still on. They were playing well together. I think they earned that. Those uh, was the two of the last five games I got off. I think they earned that very very much. So the bench was starting to play a little better. You needed the extra reps for guys like Cam Johnson, campaign. Uh, Landry Shamit, last I heard, he had a foot injury, but I do not okay. think they had an update on uh, the severity. It was on Friday I heard about it, I think, it was on the radio. But that one shouldn't be major, and if he misses a game or two, that sh- it shouldn't kill the rotation because he would play about 10 minutes or so, give or take. They can find someone to play 10 minutes for a game or two. Like it's they, yeah. They're built for situations like that. Monty Williams was saying in the interview, like, look, we're built for this stuff. And then, of course, you know, to, just to mention it real quick, Dario Saric, yes, he's still uh, rehabbing the tour is at ACL in, uh, in the finals okay. last year. So, yes, technically it's on the injury report, just in case anyone wants to mention that in the comment section. But, yeah, no, this is a yeah. very healthy squad that I'm excited to watch. And I just I don't want to talk too much more about the Suns right now. I just want to be like, let's get it done, boys. I, I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys got. I want to see it. Feed the beast. Feed DeAndre. Let Book go off. I want to see Book Ball do some some uh, Black Mamba type stuff in this playoff run. I want to see CP get his ring. Let's just let's do this. Let's do mm-hmm. this. Yep. Finally, because uh, CP hasn't won. Right. He's he's been on a couple of really good teams, but he hasn't actually won one. I don't think. Right. Nope. I think, yeah. and I could be wrong, but I'm like 99 percent sure because they I think they said it multiple times last year. Last year was his first finals appearance in his entire career. Oh, okay. he just, he's been too good for too long and yeah. I, I don't like how much he flops but that's just part of his game i guess but other than that one little thing i don't like the dude is yeah no he's a leader he's he's a warrior he's been in this league for as long as possible he helped you know with money with book with all these guys turn the culture around here in my opinion while no one is owed anything this man deserves a ring like he he's he's put in the work Let's see if they can get the job done for him. Let's see if he can help this team and get him over this hump. Yeah, for sure. And talking about getting over the hump, uh, a team that seems like they'll never get over the hump, uh, that'll be the Arizona Diamondbacks, who we talked about previously uh, and how we were kind of excited to see how the season went. They won their home opener with a uh, home run by... Seth Beer, and uh, they have already started the the tire skidding, as we will put it. Um, I think you said that they are, what, three and five? Three and five going into the today's game against the Mets, which by now has to be over. They were down like four to nothing last I saw. So let's just say three and six. Let's be safe. I don't think the anemic bats of the Diamondbacks are going to make this big comeback right now against the Mets. Considering the fact the Mets are spending like the third most in the league, and it's not even, it's not even close with the D-backs are spending right now. But yeah, <laughs> one stat that came out to me that I thought was pretty funny. I I couldn't find the tweet, but it was the D-backs team uh, ERA was somewhere around like three point six nine or three point eight nine. Without Caleb Smith, it went down to like two point eight nine. So it's like the yeah. pitching has actually been surprisingly good, except for Caleb Smith. The pitching's been actually really good. Merrill Kelly's had a couple of really good outings. Uh, I think Madison Bumgarner had a serviceable outing his first time around. I didn't get to see the notes yet, uh, the numbers for his second outing. Zach Gallon had a really good outing the other night, and the D-backs have one win per series. 
So I got to go to two of the, the baseball games, the one on Friday and uh, Sunday of the opening series. They lost both of those. Uh, they split the series with the Houston, uh, why, I, why did I almost say Arrows? The Houston Astros, they split that series and they got one win against the Mets. And uh, if they keep averaging this, if they keep averaging one win per series, I mean, I think they'll be like the first team in history to not win any baseball series. But uh, they'll, they'll have almost a historically bad season just like last year. Hopefully this time they would actually allow themselves to lose to get the number one overall pick. Unlike last year, where they had two games left, all you had to do was lose one and we get Elijah Green, but we can't have anything nice! Not I don't want Arizona. to talk about the losers anymore. I know. Look, <laughs> I love baseball. I love Diamondbacks baseball. I will never stop loving this team. I do not want to talk about them right now. I just, I want them to go away. It's like, you can just forget about them. Let's talk about another team that disappoints me. My beloved Arizona Coyotes. Rich, I, I, take I, it I away. Had a, I had a perfect send-off for you there. I was going to say, uh, talk about teams that want to disappoint in the draft. We can uh, hop right over to the Coyotes, who are the worst team in the NHL right now. And I'm sure that Gary Bettman's magic balls are going to uh, roll the wrong way for them. Yeah, let's look. Because there, there is nothing. Okay. Almost nothing. Let's let's talk about Jack McBain. I think it was a secondary assist on the Nick Ritchie goal uh, yes. last night, his first career NHL point. Hopefully the first of hundreds to come. He's a good young kid. I haven't got to watch very much of those games that him and uh, Nathan Smith has played. I got to watch the first two periods of the first first game they played. Then I decided, okay, this team sucks. I'm going to bed. Uh, that, yeah. that was pretty much what, what I was doing that night. But I thought they played serviceably, especially in their first game of the NHL. Congratulations on the first point. Like I said, first of hundreds to come. That's the only thing interesting to talk about this team because they're losing historically. They're losing yeah. six to one, seven to one, six, nine to one. And you know what? I was yep. celebrating last night. I don't know if you saw my tweets. I was celebrating last night. This team, my dad was like, oh, your te this team sucks. I'm like, no, no. This team's one of the best teams in NHL history. Right now, they are currently, they are going out there and executing the most flawless tank strategy I have ever seen. It is the most beautiful hockey you can possibly think of. They went out and got that phenom goaltender, the gold medal winning goaltender, comes in, all the all the buckets of Toronto salt, just to give up, what is it, it's five goals a game for him, or six, six goals a game it's for him? something so far in like that. Games. It has not been good. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I was going to say I was privileged enough to forget about that game. And so I was like, oh, crap, I need to put the game on. It was the end of the first period. We were up one goal. As you said, McBain got his secondary assist for his first point in the NHL, which um, just to go over that real quick, that wasn't just like a, a nothing burger of a, of a point. He actually was in the offensive zone, dropped pass back to Beagle. Beagle sees Richie charging towards the net, and uh, Beagle just hits – Richie stick perfectly with a uh, shot pass and redirection up high into the corner for uh, Richie's goal and McBain's first assist as an NHL player. Uh, yeah, so that first period finishes, and I'm going, okay, maybe this is going to be a, a good game against, uh, you know, an actually scary team. I, I have my projections of uh, I have Calgary making it to the Stanley Cup and losing to, um, who was it? It was Toronto. I think Toronto, or not, yeah, Toronto. Um, I think Toronto looks really good as well this year. I think a lot of people are underrepresenting them. But, uh, yeah, I I have Calgary going pretty deep. I I, I feel like uh, I, I've, I've got something there with Calgary. And so us pushing them to no goals in the first period I'm going oh well it'll be a low scoring game you know you know <laughs> and uh no in in 40 minutes the Calgary Flames put up nine goals told you this is the greatest hockey team in NHL history it was a flawless game plan it was from top to bottom beautifully first off they scratched Kyle Kibibianco, in my opinion, the greatest defender in Arizona Coyotes history. All right, they scratched that man because you couldn't have his greatness on the ice if you wanted to pull this off. So phenomenal performance to make him think that something's going to happen in the first period. And then just 
systematically breaking yourself down throughout the rest of the game. Like I said, flawless work. They are trying to secure that number one overall pick, which tells me they're going to get fifth overall. Let's yep. go ahead and talk a little bit about the draft. So let's go ahead and just, because we're at the point where there isn't anything else interesting to talk about, but I love this team and we're going to talk about it. Let's have a little bit of fun. What happens if they get anything below the third overall pick? Now, in my opinion, to make this historically bad season be worth it, you got to get top two. I will yeah. settle for the third overall pick. Mainly because at that point, it's like, okay, it's better than nothing. It really is better than nothing. It's like the bare, I, bare minimum. I completely <laughs> disagree with you. I think if you don't hit one or two, it's a failure. Because the reason I say this is this team has always desperately needed a franchise center. And the one and two in this draft is going to be, I don't know if they'll be franchise, but they'll be very good centers. Uh, Logan Cooley is projected to go number two. And Shane Wright is projected to go number one. We're pretty sure that that's going to be the final uh, draft order for one and two. And I think number three is kind of a, could be a winger, could be a defenseman. And that is not what this team right, needs right now. But think about it like this, because remember, my, to just to get optimistic for a minute, right? It's going to run out in a minute, but let's just get optimistic. Remember when I said they own this draft? They could be a playoff team and they could still probably get the first overall pick because of the amount of assets. If yeah. they get number three, they very realistically, depending on who gets number one and number two, they could make a move and try to still get a top two pick. And it wouldn't cost them as much to move up as if they had like fifth or seventh or tenth or whatever. So That's as long as point. they, in my opinion, still get no less than number three, I will accept it. But no, number one and number two is a, a successful season. But yeah. That's why I, I think number three is like the bare, bare minimum. Let's go ahead and talk about it. Just give me your reaction. I'm just going to start throwing out numbers and because mm -hmm. you're, the, you're the visual one here. I want to see you represent the Coyotes fans. Uh, what is your reaction? Fourth overall. Uh, you know, I, I, I fight with myself because if we want to talk about fourth overalls, um, a perfect example of that would be the 2017 draft where Colorado had historically one of the worst seasons uh, in their franchise, uh, which is similar to what the Coyotes are going through, and they dropped to fourth. Um, everybody went, wow, that's awful. This needs to be reworked. I believe that was the, uh, was it the Nico Heeshear and Nolan Patrick draft? And they ended up dropping to fourth and picking up a little guy uh, I don't know if you've heard of him. His name is Kale McCarr. Uh, so, you know, I I always think analytically in my head, I go one and two, like those are the best, you know, but it also matters on, you know, seeing a guy that you like and, and you know, hitting on that. Because if you're going to make an argument, I would say in that draft, uh, even though they picked fourth, Kale McCarr is probably the best pick out of that draft so far. I think the uh, guy in uh, Dallas, the young kid, uh, ooh, Robertson? Maybe? Nick I Robertson? That, that kid? Yeah, I think he was also in that draft, and I think he's making a, a strong fight for uh, being the second best asset in that draft. I think that was also the Elias Pedersen draft as well. So those three are like kind of the the ones that I would say are the best so far. I don't think he sure has played up to his potential. We knew Nolan Patrick was a injury liability and he has continued to show that in the NHL. And then the Vegas golden laughs decided to pay an arm and a leg for that, which is hysterical, I guess. <laughs> I They're not, not a real team. They are not the real desert hockey team. If, listen, yeah. if, if they weren't so busy trying to play a uh, ten-year-old AZ sports guy playing NHL 06, they would have one of the best young cores, not just a very, very good but injury-prone yeah. core that's kicking them out of the playoffs. They'd have one of the best young cores. Yeah, I just, just I, I don't get the logic. <laughs> just to throw some names out there for what Vegas has given up so far, uh, they gave up Brandstrom, which has looked meh in in uh, Ottawa, but. Um, in the minor leagues, he looked really good. Uh, so if he can figure that game out, remember defensemen take longer than forwards. Let's 
not kid ourselves on that. That's a legitimate thing. Um, they gave up Brandstrom. They gave up Peyton Krebs. They gave up Nick Suzuki. Uh, they gave up Cody Glass. Uh, who else am I missing on that list? Just pretty much, just think anyone they've ever gotten the first, oh, Kirby Doc, right? They had Kirby Doc? Or am I thinking about the wrong team? I thought they had Kirby Doc. Mm, Let me go ahead and no. triple check this. No, no, no. That, that was... Me? No, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, Doc was drafted to uh, Chicago. Chicago, but, you're right. Damn it. I thought yeah. he was the guy I was looking at when I was watching that draft. Never mind. Forget me. <laughs> Forget me. I just want to dunk more on Vegas. Let's go ahead and just subtract that for the record. <laughs> yes. But uh, they, if they make the, or they miss the playoffs, that will be, ooh, mm, chef's kiss from the NHL. I think everybody's rooting for that right now. Uh, people do not like their fans. The arrogance, pompousness of their fans has been just absolutely ridiculous. I I don't understand how, when you're gifted a good team like that, you're going to be that arrogant about it. I uh, I sat next to uh, some Seattle fans actually uh, three months ago, maybe, um, when uh, Seattle came in for the first time. And uh, that was actually the game. I think we won our first game after like nine straight losses or something like that. And I was talking to them about it. I was like, look, you know, your team's going to suck for a couple of years. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, I told him this. I was like, I'm not going to lie to you. But the thing is, is your team is setting itself up for a franchise future to be good for a long time. Whereas Vegas is going to be bad for a long time. If they do not win a Stanley Cup in the next two years, three years, they are going to end up being the San Jose Sharks of the desert. They will be. That That is, I, I will... I'll put my stamp down on that one. They will be the San Jose Sharks of the desert if they uh, if they fail to uh, achieve their goal of winning the Stanley Cup. And I, I know why they did it. I think the owner is, it, I think what he termed was in the relentless pursuit of the Stanley Cup. I think he knows that in that market, he has to solidify himself as a, um, as you know, the best team in Vegas after uh, the Raiders moved there, right? And I think that he is very nervous about the possibility of another team, maybe even in the NBA, moving there. Um, So I think he is in desperate need for winning a Stanley Cup because if he does not, you know, he could see that hype um, peter out in, in Vegas. Uh, to get back real quick, uh, d- wait, did you have anything else to say about Vegas, or should, can I uh, get back to the draft real quick? Uh, I, the one thing I was going to say is, look, is they would have had a cup if they would have just learned a little bit of patience because they keep going after brand names and then ruining the locker room chemistry. Yep. Nate Schmidt should have been their yep. first captain. I don't yep. care. I got to do an argument with some idiot on Twitter uh, that shall remain nameless. It's like, oh, it's the best player on the team. No, it isn't. It's the best player with the best leadership ability. And that was yep. Nate Schmidt. He was the heart and soul of that defense. It was the second year that they were in the league when he got suspended for PEDs. That defense, even though Shea Theodore is a phenomenal talent, looked terrible until he got back. It's like, but no, we need these shiny new toys. Like, no, if you would have yep. just managed properly, I still go after Stone, sure, still go after whatever. Still go after some key free agents if you want to, but you do not need to be constantly giving up your future because do you want to know why great teams stay great? They build a winning culture. They they you know acquire some key veterans while also trying to maintain some good young talent in the wings so you can slot them in when you need them and sustain it for as long as possible because yep. even after a great run is over, you got some good young kids that are going to keep you relevant. So you try to figure out what your next phase is. And Vegas didn't do that. And as someone who, who I stood up for that team, all right? When people are saying, oh, hockey doesn't belong in the desert. All that same crap they're saying about us. I was like, yeah, no. As soon as they were announced to go to Vegas, I saw that. I'm like, this is my new second team. And I, I grabbed this team. I'm like, this team's going to be my, my new second team. If the Coyotes ever move, I at least have a team in the desert, one state away I can go watch that is in California. And then just seeing how those fans, like, treat people. Not all of them, but, like, the, like, the fair weather ones. The ones that you can tell are just, like, bandwagoners. How yep. it was their second or third year in the league, and uh, my girlfriend at the time brought me to uh, a, a 
Knights Coyotes games. I'm wearing a Coyotes jersey, a Knights hat to show support for both. But I would cheer for the Coyotes when it got to overtime. I would cheer for whoever. This guy's like, yeah. oh, I saw you cheering for the Coyotes. I'm like, I'm wearing a Coyotes jersey. We're in Arizona. W- what yeah. team do you think I've been watching for the last 12, 13 years, whatever it was at that point? I'm like, dude, like that, that culture, the whole throwing away the locker room chemistry with reckless abandon, how they treated the face of their franchise, Marc-Andre Fleury. Look, if it wasn't for me being essentially held captive emotionally by the Arizona Coyotes after the don't thing, I would have never, ever came back. So like it, it's only because I love the team so much that I, I eventually got over it and got back into it. And, and it's just, no, uh, the, the situation also, still frustrates me. So it's like, now I'm like, Vegas is dead to me and I want to see them fail because they had everything right there. They were likable. They had a great group of guys, great prospects. They, fleeced so many teams in that expansion draft that thought they could like take advantage of the new guys to the point where nobody really wanted to deal with seattle like seattle got dealt a worse hand because of the vegas draft like if anything seattle fans should probably hate vegas for that and it's like i have so much pent-up anger and frustration because being in vegas with my dad for that cup run is what got me back into hockey i wouldn't be talking about arizona sports if it wasn't for that like i I'm so like conflicted when I think about it, but I'm like I'm so angry and disgusted at that organization for how they treat the people that helped make them, and then just the arrogance surrounding it. Like, yeah, no, I want to see them suck, and I want to see them suck for a while. Trade Mark Stone to a real team so we can actually win a cup. That man deserves so much better. That's my piece. I needed to get at least one rant in an episode. There you go. Uh, we're gonna uh, hop back over to draft talk real quick here. I keep saying real quick. I need to cut that out of my vocabulary. We're going to hop back over the draft talk, uh, but but ugh, speaking too fast. But first, I want to ask everybody who is listening still to this point, uh, if you could give us a like or a follow or a subscription on whatever platform that you're listening to or watching from, uh, it would really appreciate it because uh, we're a small group here, you know? Uh, Matt and I are just uh, two dorky sports nerds talking about unsuccessful sports except for one mainstream team and one uh one smaller team who are actually good here in Arizona and um you know we're we're going to keep it going no matter if all the teams suck or if all the teams are good so you know if you could give us a listen to uh you know watch uh, like uh, follow everything uh we'd really appreciate it uh as for that, I will stop with the the begging for attention, and we'll hop back over to the draft part of the Coyotes. And I was going to fi- finish up with what I was talking about. Uh, you coined the question to me if uh, the Coyotes draft at the fourth position, if it was a successful year or not. I'm going to say no. Uh, because the reason I say this is that in 2017, to get back to the point I, w- I was talking about with Colorado, that draft kind of looked like crap from the top. Um, a lot of people were saying that it was a weak draft. Uh, it wasn't a very good draft. And when you talk about the one-two punch of Heischer, Nolan Patrick, I would say they're kind of right. It wasn't a very good one-two at the top of that draft. Now, the later rounds or the later picks uh, definitely performed better than that one, two. Uh, but I don't think that this 2022 draft is going to be like that. I think that one and two are going to be very good. Um, if you're talking about centermen that we desperately need at number four, uh, Matthew Sayovi, I think that's how you say it, uh, is looking really good in his uh, Canadian team. That could be a um, Sherman that you could take it for. I, I've i seen people toss around uh, the name Geek, uh, Geeky. I think it's Connor Geeky. It, there's, I think his brother's already drafted to one of the NHL teams. So I, I never remember the first name, but last name is Geeky. Uh, he is a big boy. He is very much what uh, Bill Armstrong is looking to add to this team. Big, big body with some skill. Uh, I think he's like 6'6 oh, six, yeah. six at 18, which is crazy how big he is. I, 
I could be exaggerating. Maybe he's like 6'4", but I'm pretty sure I read a stat that says 6'6". Six, six. Um, that could be a guy that you're looking at. Uh, if you're drafting at four, my guess is it'll be either Kemmel, Joaquin Kemmel, or uh, Uri Slavkovsky. I don't know how to say that. I'm sorry. That would be my assumption at number four, and those two are wingers. Um, so another option that I could see being successful is if uh, Bill Armstrong is like, hey, we don't need wingers, we don't need Slavkovsky, Slavkovsky or Kemmel, um, maybe they trade back as well, uh, right? If you can trade back with somebody, let's say you drop from four to seven, right? And you pick up uh, Geeky, and you get maybe another second or late first out of it. I would assume probably a second. Um, that could be worth it too. Uh, you know, having a geeky and then like putting him in a couple years time with Gunther, you know, you'll have a bunch of players that are coming up. Could make sense. It could make sense. Uh, uh, what about my uh, my personal little prediction of if they go five or lower with their I don't pick think you can unless they end up finishing second last mm -hmm. i think the lowest you can draft is four um i thought it was don't lower have... than four or five slots like it was like you can go down three to five i, I could have read the rule, rule wrong so i don't officially know this was last year's draft i think the lowest you could go if you were in last was to four um we don't actually, I don't think we actually know because they haven't released um, how this year's draft is going to look. Uh, so they haven't actually even officially released what the percentiles will be for each um, position for the lottery. So um, I could be wrong. And let's say hypothetically they do fi finish fifth, um, whether that's, what you're talking about with dropping the fifth from first, I don't think you can, but if you drop from, let's say you finish second and you drop the fifth, uh, that would be really bad. That yeah. would be, that would be mayday, <laughs> mayday type scenario. Um, all right, quick, you're Bill Armstrong. All right. Cause I, at least the way I remember the rules being, is like, you, you can't jump up or jump down X amount of spots from where you were the previous year. Cause they were trying to stop tanking. So I saw yeah. that when I was watching the draft last year. So that's why I mentioned five. So let's say whatever it is, you get fifth overall, right? You mm -hmm. are B your, your GMBA. You have like, you are taken aback. What is your course of action? You, you have like 30 seconds. What is your course of action? Oh God. Okay, so if you're if you're drafting at five, I am panic buying up to at least two if I can. If if nobody's locking in and they're, or if they're locking in and saying nobody nobody's trading away, um, I would be in utter dismay and probably be selling my five to go back to maybe six, or seven, eight area. Um, that's what I'd be doing, uh, because at that point, all the assets that you're looking at from five backwards are kind of a, a, a shuffle on the board. There's a lot of really good assets. Nothing is elite. Um, so I'd be falling back a little bit, picking on a second and then praying, crossing your finger, the fingers that one of those, we currently have four seconds, but if you add a second, we would be back to five. I'd be praying that one of those five seconds would uh, hit. Uh, a good example of a player that is uh, a big hit on a second round um, would be Sebastian Ajo of the Carolina Hurricanes. He was a second round pick in the 2015 draft. Um, that would be a guy that you'd be crossing your finger, fingers praying that you'd hit on. Another one would be, I think Braden Point was a third rounder. Uh, just to give some examples of Assets that you can find in the late late rounds. And remember, it's not as far-fetched as people think. Once again, Arizona has invested a ton of money into their scouting staff. They have went from one of the worst scouting staffs to one of the best. Now, the only thing I will say is I'm still questioning their development 
um, the people that they put in charge of development, you're going to need to develop these players, uh, not only just scout good players, uh, you know, developing is the other half of that battle. So I haven't seen it yet, but if you see some pieces come in and develop really well, then um, I will lift that tag off. But yeah, my biggest thing would be you would want to walk back a little bit, uh, go from five to maybe like eight-ish and see if you can pick up a second. So now that we got the the panic out there, I liked your strategy. If I had the same exact thing, we're, we're at number five. But what I'm actually doing is a little more drastic. I'm going back to like 15 because I think I can get extra assets like yep. even more. Because you might yep. also be able to get, depending on who you're trading with, another late first. So you can technically get like two first and like a second or something. Depending on, depending on, it depends on who you're trading with, it's supply and demand and all that. That would probably be my my strategy. But one thing I do want to disagree with you now that we got... Uh, I, I think your more complete argument out is how often do we see this? And it's every year because no matter how many times we all think it's going to be different, it almost never is. Oh yeah, this winger is a better asset, so they're going to get picked here. They're going to pick, get picked here. Centers will always go above wingers, even if the wingers are clearly yeah. better talents. Look at a yeah. uh, <laughs> sorry. Look at Dylan Gunther. We got the ninth overall pick. Or was it eleven? I forget which in the last nice. draft. So nine. So we had. We had 11, but it was taken from us because of the testing players. Um, right, right. Uh, just so, to, to quickly to quickly throw out there, the 11th would have been Cole Sillinger, who has looked really good, by the way, in Columbus. Yikes. Weren't we looking to get Cole Sillinger? I thought he jumped up. Because didn't he no. get taken just for us? Cause, no, he was taken wait, after was the that guy 11. that? No, Johnson. It was that Johnson. kid Johnson. Kent Johnson yes. the guy that we wanted, and he yep. got taken above. And then an another guy I wanted in the second round, I wanted them to take Zach Dean and then take Josh Dunn with their second second round pick. Mm -hmm. But Vegas took him at the very end of the of the, the first round because centers, no matter how great a defensive prospect, a, a winger prospect, unless they're like a borderline generational looking talent, they will always a uh, center because, oh, you know, big frame, big guy, you can do more with centers. Like you see it all the time, and it leads to teams reaching on picks. I mean, look. I will always defend Dylan Strom as being a good hockey player. I think Dylan Strom, when he was here, before he got traded, he was running a more efficient power play than Clayton Keller was on the second unit. He had more power play points. I think he was top five in power or a face-off percentage. He yeah. was playing very well in uber-limited minutes on the fourth line. Yep. Should we have taken, was it fourth overall they got him, or was it a little bit lower? Third? third? They got him. So yep. sh should they have taken him third overall? No. Does he look terrible in comparison to guys that went, I think it was like fourth or fifth or seventh or whatever? Sure, yep. I'll give you that argument. I, I'm not going to sit here and be intellectually dishonest. But when you look at the product itself, Dylan Strom was and still is a good player. But when you're a franchise that needs a great player, when you're a franchise that you're looking at it like, oh, this better talent was available, I completely understand why fans look at it that way. But centers will always go first because teams think centers are safe picks yeah even though they're almost never <laughs> perfect example of that would be uh barrett hayden barrett hayden was projected to go at 15th and he went at five because he's a centerman um now a lot of people were speculating that uh he would be drafted higher than 15 i believe chicago had him at eight or nine um and they were going to be picking him at eight or nine uh they ended up not because arizona picked him at five um He's a guy who's been plagued by injuries, so I can't just say he's a bust now. I we we heard people coin that phrase at Lawson Kraus, right? Oh, he's a bust. He's a first round bust. Uh, now look at Lawson Kraus. He's uh, a big body who scares the crap out of people, and he's putting up twenty goals. You know, sometimes it takes players some time. Sometimes they get unlucky with injuries. I think that Baron Hayden has some unlucky injuries that are not injury prone injuries, but just you know, sports fast, sports physical, um, you know, things happen. Uh, yeah, just to go back to the Dylan Strom thing that you're talking about, the, the, the scary part with Dylan Strom was he was taken third overall. We were thinking he was a consolation prize because, remember, we, we were supposed to be second to last to Buffalo in 2015. Uh, that was when Buffalo literally was like, 
scamming people. <laughs> like, oh, this goalie's winning? Uh, trade him off for nothing. <laughs> Bring in the, the ECHL goalie. We want Connor McDavid. You know, that was literally what they were doing. They were... The, the whole talk about teams, you know, trying to circumvent playing, putting a productive team on the ice for intentionally tanking, Buffalo that year was absolutely doing it. The Coyotes were just bad. They weren't even, like, trading players away. Remember that they still had Mike Smith. They still had Shane Doe, and They still had, like, these big-name players that they hadn't traded away. And they're just like, yeah, we're going to suck. That's the way it goes. Actually, I don't even think they were wanting to suck. I think they, the wheels just fell out on them on that that um, that year. But they still thought uh, they were competitive. <laughs> to, yeah. To, to finish to finish what I was, I was going to say is uh, like you know we were expected to go one two. We were we were hoping for Eichel. I mean, could you imagine what this team would have been if they had Eichel? You know, we would have we would have with, with the Connor Garland. With the the Clayton Keller like like core because it would have taken a while to get good. Uh, I'm telling have... you right now because Jack Eichel is a top five center when he's healthy. Like I I will stand by that he's a damn damn good player. All right, and he would have been playing earlier. Would have been playing better even if he would have been able to get the correct surgery he wanted. And he wasn't playing in Buffalo because they're a terrible organization. But like, yeah, no, I'm, we wouldn't have had to tear up again. We would yep. still have Connor Garland. All right, I wouldn't hate Oliver Ekman Larson because it's fine. We'd score enough goals to balance out his bad defense. This team would have been a playoff team for at least what the last three years, not just that one playoff run in 2020. Yep, Darcy Kemper wouldn't have gone away. The the one thing I was gonna say is that we did trade uh, for Nick Schmaltz, Schmaltz, so we wouldn't have had him on the team. Uh, it would have been Eichel for Schmaltz essentially. Would it would be the hypothetical that we're playing here? That's um, so one sided. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine doing that now? Like, oh don't get my me wrong, God. I, I like Schmaltz and he's played really well so far this season, but I still <laughs> think that Eichel has that gear that is next level. And then also adding a healthy Jacob Chikrin to the mix. Yeah, that this team would have looked a lot better with just one addition in a franchise center. Uh, to, to finish up what I was talking about, the crazy part. And the scary part about drafting and why it is so important to not just draft, but to also have those developmental coaches that um, develop these players into really successful NHLers. Uh, it's not like Dylan Strom was rushed, right? We see it sometimes where a young player gets rushed into the league and they uh, suffer because of it. Uh, their, their growth suffers. Uh, this was not the case with Dylan Strom. He played, I think it was two more years after that in the Juniors League. And then he played, I think, one year or maybe a, a half year in the AHL before he finally hit the NHL. They did everything right with Dylan Strom. Before they, he came to the Coyotes. Yeah, I, I do want to say there because Rick Tockett was the, was the worst coach, coach for him. You could tell... Rick Tockett did yeah. not see him in his system. And that yeah. happens. That happens all the time. No one wants to talk about it. Co coaches will not like certain players. And then I don't want that guy in my lineup. So they'll give him limited minutes. They'll begrudgingly put him on the fourth line. Because if you look at it, most of his minutes in that 18, 19 year when I first started getting back into hockey was all fourth line minutes, some third line minutes, second unit power play time. Because, well, you got to use your third overall pick on the power play. It's, it's, not to cut you off, I genuinely do not mean to cut you off. It's just like no, that happens all the time. Uh, you know, previous regimes of, of GMs will draft a guy, and then the new GM will not like that same guy and ship him off for nothing, or let him you know waste away in the minors. Like it's you gotta develop him, and then have a coach like I, Andre. If Andre Turnier was the coach, I genuinely believe Strom could have been a twenty-five to thirty goal scorer in Arizona. It's I could be completely wrong, but that's what I believe. If we had a coach like Turnier. In a system like Turnier's, I, I genuinely think that. So, like, didn't mean to cut you off. I just, I really wanted to add that. Yeah, could you imagine Dylan Strom, who, let's not joke ourselves, he is a smart mind. He has good hands. He has a below average shot, and he has below average foot speed. But his biggest assets are his brains and his hands, right? If you put a guy like that on a line with Connor Garland and, let's say, Michael Bunting... Could you have imagined what that would have been like, 
right? You know, instead you let Bunk Bunting cook so much in the the minor leagues that he was able to freely walk in free agency, right? Like, just saying, there's some hypotheticals here that we look at and we go. Why was this not the case? Oh, well, it's because Tockett decided that we were going to only defend. And if you wanted to go score a goal, you had to dump it into the corner. You weren't allowed to go over the line with it, which is, I don't know. Great I defensive disagree. scheme. I'll give him that. I always gave him the credit for that. But the problem was you saw it. And you saw it with the de- with the degradation of that defensive line. Not only, look, Golagoski in his final year here played well. I'll give him credit for that. He was playing terribly defensively before that. Oh, yeah, was playing terribly defensively. Kevin Bianco was playing phenomenally in the AHL. They gave him such limited minutes because I did not want to give him any time. Then he got that injury, which is a huge setback for him. He had other yeah. young defenders that were playing well in the AHL that could have got some games here, some games there. Uh, Labushkin was a, a godsend. I forgot how. I think we signed him as a free agent. Just godsend yep. getting that guy, but... When the defense was there, when the, the talent was there, it was phenomenal. It was one of the best shutdown systems I've seen as an Arizona Coyotes fan. Not in the league, not in history, as an Arizona Coyotes fan. But then you saw that quality degrade. You saw more injuries. Even Nick Yomelson, one of the best shutdown defenders other than Zabinic McCulloch that I've got the privilege to watch. You saw that skill start to, dir- start to drip. You saw him start to miss some games. The overall defense first nature didn't work anymore. And instead of actually saying, okay, we got some kids, let them go. And he, he kind of had to last year to try to save his job. That's why yeah. Bunting ended up coming in. Uh, even Peterson, Lane Peterson came from the NHL and had a pretty decent, like, was it 10 game stretch? It, yeah. It was, it, other than that, it was, and I always said it, I, I think this really does say it best. The offense was good in spite of Rick Tockett's system because it was very much physical, big burly. You needed essentially prime Milan Lucic on every line for the system to work correctly offensively. And it yeah. needed to have like crisp, clean Gretzky style passing with like a Mark Messier finisher. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Uh, I love Connor Garland. He was without a doubt the best offensive player on the team. Uh, he's not on the level of any of those guys I just mentioned in the time periods I just mentioned. It's- yeah. Let's just be clear. (laughs) So the worst part about the system that astonished me was, like you said, he wanted to play defensive, big, burly style game. Okay. Makes sense. Why was Lawson Krauss having one of the worst seasons under him? Why was he not successful? Why was Christian Fisher's development stifled under him? All of these players are the type of players that he wanted on his team, but were unsuccessful. Right? Why? Well, that's because he doesn't know how to develop talent. Like, that's unfortunately just the truth. Um, It's the same problem that so many of these veteran coaches get. I mean, this is why Dallas is the way it is. Because they're another team who is like, Ah, you're 20 years old? Nah, we don't want you. We want this 34-year-old to come in and take that position. Like, constantly doing that, you're going to be stuck in purgatory. Now, luckily, Dallas did have that season in the bubble where they went all the way to the cup. I don't think they're going to be doing that anytime soon. I think that was... uh, I think that was... they, they, They caught fire at the right time, and I it's really hard to find that that cut catch fire at the right time mentality every season. There's no way. And we can give them credit. Like right now they're on a pretty good stretch, but yeah. It, how are they going to play when the actual playoffs roll around? You can give them all the credit you want right now for their stretch in a wild card spot right now. Mm-hmm. But it's like, yeah, it's, you can't also reliably turn that off and on. Look at Montreal last year. Now, there was different contexts there. Carey Price, Shea Weber, sure. Uh, key guys left. I think it was Dan O, because I got yep. yelled at in one of my YouTube videos for saying the wrong name, even though I kept looking at, at the screen and said Dan O. I just said Druan. But, yeah, no, it's you can't consistently turn that off and on. Play Teams, you know, they'll play really well for one year and then immediately die off. That was one of the main reasons I did not trust Minnesota going into this year. 
I'm like, look, you see it all the time. Meteoric rises and then slowly pittering out or going right back down to mediocrity or it was just the right the right thing at the right time. Like with the Coyotes, I love Dave Tippett. The things he helped do for this team, phenomenal. He couldn't coach a young player. The Rick Tockets, Dave Tippett's, they need their veterans because I know what to I know what to expect with them. And that's the mindset where with these like that's why I love like the younger coaches, the newer minds. Stop recycling the same old guys because Tippett, if if they would have kept going the way they were going with Devo, with with Garland, whatever, and they would have actually spent money to try to get to the cap this year, I do not think having Tippett would be a bad idea on this team. But if you're going the young route, Turnier, amazing. I, I think if they would have given, if they would have built on what they were doing and found a way to keep Taylor Hall, I wouldn't even have been opposed to keeping Tockett last year if they would have kept trying to build on it instead of just letting the talent degrade. Uh, but if they're going to let the talent degrade, bring in the coach that you're going to want to set up for the future. Like it's it's all about what you're looking for and and knowing what to expect because some coaches are phenomenal with an established roster. Some coaches are great at developing that roster, but can't capitalize on it. It's sometimes you just need that experienced coach as your assistant until it's time for them to be the head coach. Mm -hmm. Coaching is so important. It is so ridiculously important. And I, I cannot stress this enough to people that don't pay attention. You can have this team right now. This minute could have a first line of Patrick Kane, Connor McDavid and Connor Garland and still be the worst team in the league. If it comes down to system, scheme, fit, the rest of your roster, injuries, coaching, your GM, chemistry, all these different factors. So it's like, when someone like me that's annoying, that harps on about how I didn't like talking for this, this, this reason, it's not because he's a bad person. Although from what I've heard, he isn't a very great person, but we're not going to get into personals here. It's because I look at what's on the ice, and I want greatness. I want this team to do well. I want this to get better. I'm seeing these problems, and I'm a Joe Schmo. I'm a fat guy sitting in a sweaty chair in an office that no one will ever care about on these big stages. And I can see these problems. Yep. So you cannot tell me the professionals that are watching don't see them. You cannot tell me that man getting paid a few million dollars a year to lead these guys can't see them. And I'm like, dude... If you adjust this, if you fix these problems, if you go with professionals that are like, hey, these are your issues, do this, do this, this team could have been great. Like, actually great. Not like all-time great. I mean, like, a great team to watch, a team that would have been, like, at least fifth seed, a team that would have made a playoff run or two. Like, it's all, like, I could see it. I Give me almost any one of their cores, except for after the 13-14 season. They just completely let that go because we're going to pretend to be competitive and get a bunch of old guys like Martin Erat. But almost any core, you could see it if you just watch the games. Yeah, I think a great example of that was actually when you came over to my house to watch during the playoff bubble, uh, the play-in round when they played Nashville, they played that style that you're talking about. They played loose, they played fast, they played zone entries, and they shit kicked Nashville. And then guess what? You go up against the juggernaut, you know, avalanche team. And all of a sudden it goes back to uh, dump the puck into the corner and and get your, your line change. Like, what what happened, you know? They overthought it. And it happens all the time in sports too. They just they overthought it. And the thing is, mm -hmm. I give the I give that team so much credit. I was so proud with what they did in games. I think it was one in one and two. It took until the third period on both those games for Colorado to score anything. That defense was shutting them down. Yeah. But when your offense isn't doing anything because you're trying to play dump and chase with a team that can't effectively dump and chase efficiently, effectively, well, mediocre affect it you know do the dump and chase like it it's not going to work and then the yep. one game they stole pardon my french just pissed off the avalanche and any chance they had gone right there yep oh, it's, it's frustrating because yep. that, that team could have been great i'm not going to say they would have 
but they could have beaten the Avalanche if they would have came in with that same game plan and, and the same intensity from that that national series. It would have been a seven game series if they're winning it. They're not winning it in less than seven, but they could have won that series. Yep. All right. Well, I have one more question to you before we send you off. Yes, uh, sir. Because I discussed it a little bit earlier on in this podcast. Uh, who are you picking to go to the Stanley Cup this year? Ooh. All right. I was actually going to do another one of those when they released the, the software, a uh, little like uh, tournament brackets or whatever. But if I had to just, yeah. you know, just top of my head, uh, first off, Toronto, they're finally going to make it out of the first round, get eliminated in the second round because that's what they do. Uh, Colorado is not going to make it out of the second round because they're a joke of an organization that can never get over the hump. At me. I don't care. I hate Colorado now, and I will always trash talk them. Prove me wrong. Anyway, Florida. It's Florida's year. It's it's their year to fumble. Carolina is such a great team. Part of me, I, I don't know how the matchup would work, the, the bracket. I would love to see a Carolina and and Florida conference finals. I think that would be a phenomenal seven game series. I still think Florida is just, they're on this weird level right now. I I just I mm-hmm. and I, I part of me is just I love it. Look, I I also really do like Carolina genuinely, and I would love to see him win another cup. Uh, Florida has no cups. I want yeah. Florida to get that legitimacy. So it's like I can have that empathy like for other teams, especially like those small market teams. I'm I'm Arizona boy. I get it, but I just my gut is saying Florida. Just. Heart of hearts off of the top of my head. Out of the West, you know what? Let's go for chaos. Let's just completely throw everything around. Let's say St. Louis. They're having one of the more greatly underrated seasons. I yeah. don't think that team is a cup team, but they are a damn good playoff team that could take some teams by surprise. They got good skill. They got a good roster. Let's say St. Louis, Florida. Florida wins in six. Let's just say it's my my prediction. Okay. All right. You ready for my prediction here? All right. What you got? So we've had a a, a no Canada Cup for a long time here. I'm going with the all Canada Cup. Um, a lot of people are gonna harp me on this, but I I don't know. This is how I'm feeling. Um, <clears throat> in the East. I am going with the conference final. I am. It's going to be Toronto versus Florida. And I think Toronto makes it to the Stanley Cup. Now, the reason I say this is because all the pressure is off of them. I think everybody's writing off Toronto. They're saying, ah, oh, what a joke they are. Ah, oh, this team can't make it out of the first round. I think they're going to come in pissed. I think they are going to be pissed off and they are going to be ready to play. And the reason I say that is we said the same thing about the Washington Capitals. Ah, what a joke. Ovi is going to be the best player to never win a Stanley Cup. Ah, blah, 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 blah. And then they won it. I think this is going to be the year that Toronto makes it and I think they are going to go deep. All right? So this is what... This is what I'm going in the East. For the West, I am also in agreement with you that uh, the Blues will make it out of the first round. In the West, I'm going the Blues in the conference final, and I am going the Calgary Flames in the conference Ooh, final. Ooh, okay, okay. I think that the Calgary Flames are buzzing. They made some excellent pickups at the deadline, which is what you want to see. They also have a tenured coach who knows how to win Stanley Cups. As much as as much as we want to insult uh, Dale Daryl Sutter, I call him Mush Mouth because he always has <laughs> like I don't even know how to do it. Like that face, he always has it going on. Uh, I think that the Calgary Flames have excellent goaltending. I think I think. Uh, Markstrom is an, a gem that doesn't get talked about very much. Uh, I think that that defensive core and that offensive core are really good. I think they're going to be hard to beat. I think they're going to be hard. 
I think that's going to be my final is going to I'm going to say that uh, Calgary is going to beat St. Louis and I think it's going to be a deep one. I think it'll be a six or seven gamer. And we're going to see an all Canada Cup. Canada is finally going to win a cup. Whether it's Calgary or Toronto, I don't know. I think that Toronto chokes at the last Ooh. second. I think they get right when the pressure really, builds. I get it. The really <laughs> close. I think they 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 have this piss and vinegar attitude, but I think the wheels fall out at the last second, and that the Calgary Flames will bring, be the first Canadian team to bring back the cup to Canada since 19, was it 94 when the Habs did it? I think that's the stat. I think that's going to be what I see. I respect it. All right, look, I I, I love the Toronto hate. I, I'm never going to stop doing that. It's fun. But uh, I, I can, like... My brother-in-law, funny enough, is actually a Calgary fan. He's also an L.A. fan, but I've been trying to beat him out of that and get him to be a Coyotes fan, so he'll love losers. But I can like call. I can like Calgary. Also, a fellow YouTuber, I don't give Kachuk. Pauly D is my little brother. Mm. Seeing that kid get to celebrate a cup, I think that would be fun. I Johnny Gaudreau is a good player. I love Matthew Kachuk. They have a likable team. I, yep. I, I'm not changing my prediction at all, but if if that happened... I'd be okay with that. I that's a likable team, likable group, a fan base that I have seen a surprising lack of anti Arizona sentiment. Does not mean it doesn't exist, but I have seen a surprising yeah. lack of, so it makes it easier to not hate them. I can respect that. I like it. I I, I can I can vibe. Yep, that's my prediction. And I could be totally wrong. Obviously we don't know the standings and where they're going to finalize either. Obviously, this is all extrapolation that we're just guessing on. These teams could play each other in the first round, um, obviously. We'll do something more once those positions get locked in after the season. Um, but my knee jerk, those are the, the, the teams that I'm going with. And uh, yeah, I think I think we covered everything for today's episode. A little bit of a longer one. But uh, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Or, you know, surprisingly enough, I actually almost broke my own rule. I wanted to talk about the gremlin that must not be named on this podcast because mm. more developments happened that gave me an axe to grind and a reason to trash talk. But mm. I'm going to do that I'm on the AZ Sports Guy channel. So check me out on YouTube so I don't feel like I'm not important. Plug. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, I think this has been another successful episode. We've made it a full month, four weeks. Uh, I thank everybody for their support. I thank uh, everybody for listening. And uh, we're going to keep on cruising. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, we'll see you later.